I know you're probably anxious to get this party started. Um, and I admire you for coming into, you know, a hardcore data kind of presentation. I know it wasn't the most like attractive thing it was on the <laughs> on the plate. But um, as you know, uh, underpinning all of this is the need to really understand how well it works, right? And not only how well it works from um, the individual class perspective, which is where we kind of started this project, but really how well it works in terms of how we're achieving our mission and whether or not we are accomplishing as an institution what we set out to accomplish. So um, that's why I kind of have our, our little uh, journey here laid out in terms of, um, of climbing a mountain because both in terms of this project and I think as an institution, that's really where we're at, right? And we really have to kind of rope ourselves together in order to get where we need to go. In fact, this entire project was done by a committee. And I know all of our faculty are probably going to be shocked and horrified that anything could be actually accomplished <laughs> in the context of a faculty committee. Um, but this is the work of not only myself, um, but uh, Jim DeLilio, who is actually, I teach in information systems and technology management. Primarily, I teach the core classes for information systems for business innovation across all of our programs at the Grazidio School. Um, Jim uh, teaches decision, decision sciences, so he works in quant. And um, uh, Ray Valadez is an economist. Joanna Forsyth is uh, from our finance. And um, uh, of course, Navita Rogers, a uh, shout out to uh, the OIE who played a, an important role in helping us understand what we wanted to get out. And um, uh, as you know, we've just learned a lot about things that are happening in the tech learning space and how we can move that into the classroom. And there is a lot that's going on in that space. However, what happens on the front end, as critical and as important and as kind of mysterious and magical as that can be, <laughs> What's really important <laughs> is what's happening on the back end, right? I'm, I'm a mother of small children, so I can testify <laughs> to that particular fact <laughs> with great accuracy that it really is, you know, what's happening and how you understand what's going on that is ultimately going to determine success. And so um, w the project that we're working in is actually in the predictive data analytics section, the er learning analytics. Um, and I think... Um, it's important because this whole area is exploding, not only in higher education, but absolutely every enterprise um, right now is trying to get their arms around um, big data. How can you understand what is going on so that you can best serve your stakeholders, so that you can create value, and so that you can succeed in your mission? And that is precisely what this, uh, what this project is about. <clears throat> and, you know, the Department of Education has this really um, important mandate right now, which is to understand how well higher education is doing. We have soaring student debt, which is a big problem. And, uh, and coupled with that, we have, um, uh, in some ways, <laughs> a lack of understanding of how well institutions are performing. Um, and given federally funded financial aid, the government is naturally concerned with, what have you done for me lately? And um, this is not a new movie, by the way. If, I'll give you just a glimpse into my jaded past. Um, I came here in 1999 to Pepperdine from uh, Asia. I spent the bulk of my career prior to that as a faculty member and working in industry in Japan and other parts of Asia. Same thing happened in Asia about that period of time, particularly in Japan. That happened to us in 2008. Although the magnitude and the scope is different, certainly there was the financial crisis, um, a real estate bubble, followed by political um, ups and downs for a <coughs> long period of time. And that story has not had a happy ending yet. So I think there's a lot we can learn from that. And one of the things we have to learn is how we as an institution can be flexible and how we can understand directly how we as faculty can reach and accomplish our, our mission in the marketplace. Now this, as I mentioned, started as a project related um, directly to students and what was happening in the classroom. But, um, uh, but, it's, but it ended with this question, which began the bulk of what I'm going to show you today, okay? So are, how many people here are about five foot, are, are taller than five foot 11? Okay, how many people here are about six foot? 
Okay, all you people who are taller than five foot eleven, I want you to stand up. Now the rest of you, I want you to tell me, do you think that they could be successful in a circus? <laughs> <laughs> okay, it depends on what circus job they do. What else? Do you think? What do you think? How would we figure that out? What could we do to help them be successful in a circus? Teach them somersault. Well. <laughs> <laughs> and some of them are already thinking, I work in a circus. There's jugglers, I get attacked by a bear every once in a while. <laughs> you guys get to tell them. <laughs> well, there's some basic assumptions that we have in education. Uh, and we've been using these assumptions for a long time to inform what we do in the classroom. In fact, um, <clears throat> I, I also edit a journal, Technology and Society, which is published by Elsevier. And Elsevier is the largest publisher of scientific work. They publish Galileo's work. They've been around for 500 years, OK? So whenever I visit them and uh, Oxford and other places in Europe, I realize we haven't changed as an enterprise <laughs> in close to 500 years when it comes to many things. And we particularly haven't changed when it comes to some very basic assumptions about what we do, such as this. Is it possible to predict success for our students? Every time we make an admission decision, we are suggesting that indeed <laughs> it is possible. Okay? So this was the question that we started with. And, and when we started this project, we kind of started with this idea that any pathway through learning would be linear. Okay? And we thought that it would be linear because I chair and the people that you just saw on this committee chair the BSM, the Bachelor's of Science in Management program. And so we connect with community colleges. We bring in primarily mid to senior level managers who need to complete their degree. And then if they reach certain standards, they move into our MBA program. So it's called a joint MBA BSM program. We shorten that to MBAJ. So don't be frightened by some of the acronyms that you'll see. And we assumed, given that description, that this whole process should be linear and that there are certain gateways that you can predict success. Okay. But then we question that, hmm, can you predict success? And what would you do to predict success? And could, in fact, this whole process be nonlinear? <clears throat> could it be something <laughs> that requires feedback? Could it be something that people come in at different times? And in fact, maybe we're actually asking the wrong questions in admission. And let me stop here, because I don't want to be accused at all of, uh, of anything to do with standards. I'm not suggesting we change our standards at all. Okay, so I just want to put that out there. Um, so, <laughs> because I know that's where people will start throwing apples. I'm, I'm not uh, suggesting that we change our standards. I want to repeat that three times. That's the third <laughs> time, okay? Um, and I think that's important to say because what we learned in this process was we were asking the wrong question. Okay, we had been asking for a long time at these different gateways, <clears throat> well, what's the minimum GPA? And we figured, well, is that a good question? If we can actually predict success, is that the right question to ask? Maybe we should be asking, how can we help people succeed? And what are the factors that predict success? And maybe that's how we should think about this process. I don't know. We still don't have all the answers. But, um, but this is what we ask. What are the success factors for this joint program? Can we at least figure something out around that? And um, in order to do that, we, uh, we looked at a bunch of data from 2004 to 2009 of all of our graduates, and this is what we found. GPA does not predict success in the program. So I'm telling you the punchline before I actually tell you the rest of the story, OK? Um, that's basically what we found. <coughs> what else did we find? <coughs> we found that even though we raised the GPA standard moving from our BSM program through to our graduate program, our historical time series data showed that the final GPA for our fully employed MBA grads um, now typically exceeds the GPA for those who went through BSM. That raises other questions. Why? What's going on there, right? And um, pre-2008, <coughs> all of the GPA of these people who went through, it was higher. And after 2008, no. So why is that? Um, and so this raises a lot more questions, right? But one thing we knew when looking at the data is it didn't necessarily predict success. Um, we also looked at these MBAJ students, <coughs> and we looked at those who completed the degree active and discontinued. We looked at all of them, 
And um, it suggested in our statistical analysis that GPO only explained about 25% of the variation in the graduate programs. That's not very much, so the GPA is not telling us a whole lot. Um, when we broke this down, and I'll show you how we did this, but we broke this down according to classes because we thought, well, what are the factors then that predict success? Is it the qualitative classes? Is it the quantitative classes? Can you find, you know, different skill sets that might predict success? So as a first cut at this tree, we separated our curriculum into the qualitative classes and the quantitative classes, and I'll show you that. And we did find that there was a greater sensitivity between the quant classes and their success, if we measure that success okay, in, um, in the graduate program. But we found that um, there was little additional uh, variation that was explained if you break this out. Okay, so it did a better job. There was a stronger correlation between the quant classes. Um, in other words, those who were in the, the full employed MBA program who did extremely well in finance and accounting and, and those classes um, were more likely to be successful. So we thought this was very interesting, um, but we wanted to see if there were other things, okay? So what other factors might, um, might actually predict success? And our first thought was, because we're a graduate program and we're a graduate business program, is that if you actually look at their work experience, we should find <laughs> that those who have been out there will do better. And it turns out that wasn't exactly the case. Um, <coughs> And so we th we're looking at the faculty recommendations, seeing if there's something, if we can break that down into factors that are identified, such as professionalism, accountability, maturity, if, the, if there are factors within those recommendations um, that may um, suggest likelihood for success. So let me just back up now that you know the end results and what we discovered that GPA did not predict success, and, um, and tell you a little bit about what we did find. Um, what we looked at, data from 2004 to 2009, and um, we looked at graduates of our fully employed MBA and MBAJ programs, and we looked at their GPA, okay? So we wanted to see whether they met this criteria, and you can see what our sample size was across those years. And um, one of the things that I think uh, is important to note um, is that, you know, the MBAJ program, our students who are completed are currently active or have discontinued between, you know, the last couple, between 2000 and 2012. So we did, you know, dig back as far as we can into the, um, into the sample size in order to have something reasonable to work with. And these are just the descriptive statistics. For those of you who like numbers, the, the people at the school walk are kind of shut down right now. <laughs> <laughs> Do it, okay? Um, one thing we did find that was really important in just the descriptive statistics was the fact that if we're looking at those who graduated, and that's the big punchline for the Department of Education, how many of your, how many of your students are completing the programs and graduating, right? Um, we found that our MBAJ students were completing at an extraordinarily high rate, 98% of them were successful if you kind of graduation is the mark of success, okay? Where there was a difference was in the final GPA. That's something worth noting. And, uh, and the variance um, over just this small time period was interesting, um, it, and it was significant. But the fact that those who actually completed and graduated having walked this path um, uh, were tended to be more successful if you count graduation as that factor um, is very interesting. But there were some false positives and false negatives, and this is really important to know. Um, that's what we want to avoid, right? We want to avoid admitting people who will not succeed, you know, who have met all the criteria, hands down, are way up there in terms of GPA and all these fabulous things we want them to do, but they don't succeed. Um, and we had some of those, right? And then we had, on the other hand, um, students who um, were at the lower end of, of that threshold and, uh, um, and they were very successful. So, you know, we have, and perhaps there are those, given our new matrix of understanding uh, uh, which specific classes predict success, who might have really been successful. So, you know, there could be some false negatives in there. <laughs> There's someone lurking at the door. <laughs> it's just John. <laughs> so that was really important. 
<laughs> and um, and you can see that you know the quant GPA. This is just showing that it was uh, it was a, a a fairly good predictor, okay, of success in the program. Um, and I wanted to also show you this trend in terms of the GPA, which is intriguing. You know what happened at certain days that or at a certain period of time that there's this inflection point and what's going on there that's worthy of more consideration. But this is just um, basically showing. Um, the overall trend in graduates and their GPA uh, and other things that are going on because you know what happens at, uh, uh, with your department chairs and the associate deans, they're going to say, you know, we need those GPAs to be lower because um, <laughs> your, your standards are off, but there's great inflation. We've got to do something about that. So, you know, there's all these exogenous factors or, or endogenous factors that may have influenced some of these results. It would be interesting to understand you know, that inflection point and what's going on around it. But um, nonetheless, and you can see that we haven't actually looked beyond this, what it means. Um, and it's interesting that even though these GPA are lower, that they graduate at a much more significant rate. And I think um, this begs even more questions. Because if the Department of Education is just, marrying, is just measuring graduates and not necessarily how well educated they are, <laughs> we could end up with a society of uneducated people who have graduated um, very quickly and efficiently and effectively. And, and so we have to be very, very careful of what markers we use. And this is why we want to get in and understand what's happening in terms of back-end learning analytics. It's extremely important um, to understand what's going on in these figures. Um, so this is where I'm showing this, this outlier and the fact that um, minimum BSM GPA is moderately correlated with um, MBAJ um, GPA. So, you know, it's not a reliable um, predictor. And also, you know, it's worth understanding just the outliers. What happened there? Some great research and, in, and insightful information comes from just focusing on those. Um, and this is if you remove that outlier um, and you focus on the quant GPA, you can see that, um, that there's uh, um, uh, that there are some effects, okay? So if we required a BSM quant GPA that is greater than 3.2, we could remove two of the unsuccessful MBAJ candidates, but that would mean that we would remove eight successful ones. So you can see just by some very um, uh, uh, non-surgical modeling, <laughs> I'll say, that this arbitrary measure can have an extraordinary impact particularly if you're not measuring the right thing in terms of success. So I, I want to sit here for a minute and let us think about this, because um, this is the big debate amongst the committees is, you know, what should this GPA be, and what are these factors, and we're assuming that this is a really powerful predictor. And in this model, which is using the actual data, if you adjust it just a little bit, there are eight people who graduated and did well in the program who would not have been in the program. Okay, if you just use the, the quant GPA. So we have to be careful about how we think about these things and we need to be informed by data in order to make these decisions and not just you know, throw a dart at the wall and assume because we've done this for 100 years and this has been an important predictor, it can help us achieve what we want to achieve. Okay, so we looked at work history and, um, and what we found when we looked at work history was that it um, did not correlate at all with <laughs> success which is fascinating. And we have all these theories now popping up that we need to test as to why. Was it because, you know, if you have family and you have kids and you have all this tax on your time that your GPA is naturally going to be lower? <coughs> is it because if you have all this stuff, you're just not really going to care so much about your GPA. You're focusing on the end goal and what you learn. And, you know, there's a lot of things that could be involved here that are worthy of us understanding as we try to build out our predictions for success, and therefore how we help people achieve success. Um, so this was a very interesting start on understanding this particular problem. And one of the other most interesting out, um, outputs is this graph right here, which I know some of you are like, I don't want to see any more numbers, stop hurting me. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so let me explain this, because this is really a thing of beauty. And the graph you saw with with the line going down and all the pretty dots showing that if you move the GPA at a certain place, that um, there will be certain results. 
Well, this particular matrix is interesting because taking those, um, you know, those quant classes and those qualitative classes that we know have some predictive capacity, um, you can actually start to develop out a story of, well, hmm, um, your overall cumulative GPA is here, but your quant GPA in specific classes is here. You know, you really need to revisit this material. And wouldn't it be nice to tunnel down even further and uh, be able to talk about this? And in fact, we at the business school understand data so intimately. I'm just going to ask a random person in the audience to comment on this slide. You, sir, can you tell us a little bit more about this slide? <laughs> <laughs> so this is, this is a, an ability to predict what the, um, what the success of GPA would be for an MBA J student based upon breaking out their qualitative GPA and their quantitative GPA from the BSM program. Mm -hmm. Would you like to Does that sound right? Does that sound right? That sounds that's spot on. And he just walked in the room. <laughs> <laughs> we are so good here. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's Jim Galileo, who's my co author. <laughs> 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 and in fact, I'll let you explain this one too, Jim. Sure. <laughs> I do apologize for running late. I came from Irvine, so traffic isn't always as cooperative as I would like. So um, the previous slide, we showed how we broke out because we had a hypothesis that the, there was a relationship in terms of the success of students going into the MBA program that was driven by maybe how they were doing more qualitatively driven courses, like maybe an organizational behavior course versus a more quantitative course like a statistics or a finance course. And so we were able to obtain the data within, within entirely throughout, and that's why it says that we excluded our first variable, which was just the, the entire uh, BSM GPA, um, and only looked at these two additional um, independent variables. Unfortunately, we don't have a very high R squared, so a prediction is going to be somewhat problematic, but what you can see very clearly by looking at <coughs> Uh, both the test statistics and the p-values, that you've got a very strong level of significance of qualitative and an, an extremely strong quantitative uh, component to uh, measuring how well an MBA J student would do. So um, that was very encouraging because we had suspected that with quantitative courses there was less, uh, less, a subject, less of subjective grading. It was more, uh, more objective, um, generally speaking, and uh, we believe this, this largely proves that out. Excellent. Well, I think you may even want to speak to more of this, Jim. <laughs> what, else, what else do we have here? The observations. Take it away. Sure, sure. So, so here we have um, just the, the first bullet is really just a summary of what we saw in the previous slide, which is strong statistical, statistical significance um, in the p-values for whether or not we're monitoring their quantitative or their qualitative GPA, where the quantitative GPA is, has much, much stronger significance. Um, we also then had a hypothesis that, you know, we, we see a number of our students come in with a varying degree of work history. The work history could be, you know, just a handful of years. Uh, in some cases, we have students that are coming through the BSM program that might have 20 plus years of experience, maybe even run their own businesses. Mm -hmm. um, so um, very non-traditional in that particular sense. Um, and we thought, well, maybe there's a relationship on the success of our MBA students that is related to the work history. Um, unfortunately, there we actually didn't really see any uh, sufficient data to, to suggest one way or another. Um, there were actually only a few individuals, and this was the, the, the biggest challenge with our sample. Um, largely, our MBA J students are successful in the program. We have about a 2%-ish mm -hmm. uh, rate of students that have issue. In fact, you can see those 2% of our sample. Um, that's these four that have been identified. And in fact, um, this is a little bit more anecdotal because we don't have enough data to make any type of statistical inference. But you can see that the ones that had trouble actually had more than 12 years, more than 12 years of work experience. So it's not enough to really draw st any strong conclusions on. Um, but it does suggest that, you know, that maybe there is a relationship. But um, in a lot of respects, what we're seeing is a good thing. We're not seeing a lot of students having trouble in the MBAJ program. They're, they seem to be doing very, very well. Could did you define not unsuccessful by a low grade or not graduating? Not graduating. In this graduating. case, it was graduation. Yes. When we went to the work history, it was graduation. But we did look deeply at the GPA to see whether or not that was a fact. But then those could be what you said about other relationships or other right. responsibilities. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and if, yeah, we, we even speculated that, you know, maybe if you're getting into this level of work history, you've got an older student, maybe they're now, now they're married, they've got a family to care for, they've got other job responsibilities, maybe their life is just getting a little bit more, a little more complicated. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that might mean certain things will slip off their plate and they wouldn't perform maybe as well as, you know, maybe, maybe our, our students that maybe don't have quite as many responsibilities. I mean, this is largely it's speculative. It's conjecture, though, right? So we're just <coughs> guessing. We're making up history of people, you know? They've been married twice. They have four kids, yeah. you know? It's all conjecture. It's Hollywood. But I think it's an interesting story, right? We need to figure it out. Right. And um, it, it could also be that maybe in their technical background, there's some piece that, you know, that was missing because it was so long ago, even though we check for that and we have you know, different, um, different ways of trying to figure that out, uh, particularly as they move from one program to the other. We don't know, so. so should, we, should we press on? Oh, let's press okay. on. Okay. Oops, sorry. These slides are far more sophisticated than I'm accustomed to. <laughs> okay, so, um, so here's some further attempts, right? Um, go ahead. Yeah, so, so we also, we, we ran a likelihood estimator, and in fact, I'll say to, uh, is, is is Ray here today? No, Ray. So, Ray. so actually, Ray Valdez was actually a port. He was he was involved in this this aspect of the study. He used a slightly different statistical program to, to essentially validate the results. So we, we did want to make sure we didn't have any type of uh, numerical or quantitative errors within our analysis. And so, what Ray had done here, uh, using a slightly different um, piece of software, basically was able to to vet what we had seen and validate uh, and give us additional level of confirmation that what we were seeing uh, was indeed correct and accurate. Excellent. I think that explains the entire thing. Um, actually, yeah, the one. Here we go. Oh, the right arrow. I guess. Yeah. Oops, sorry. Yeah. So here, here is actually um, kind of a similar ability to, to, to estimate um, based upon linear regression or or multiple regression. He actually used a robust multiple regression, which was a little bit different than what we use, but ge still generally speaking, the same thing. You can see here the work experience actually has a slightly negative component here, uh, and that was reflected by the fact that we had a few of those observations in our sample that we're having trouble with those larger numbers of work experience. Okay. Is that it? Yeah. <laughs> so, so this brings us to some heavy thinking. Um, as we went through this um, whole process and, and we're thinking about this key question of can you predict success, what factors would pr predict success, it actually brought us to an even deeper question. Can you and talk that about success? You mean at the program, at school, rather than success in life? Well, you know, that's where I'm getting. You know, there's, there's missional success, too. There's success in their career, success in purpose, success in leadership. And we really need to get underneath that. We have insufficient data. And we actually haven't even developed um, significant ways of, of dealing with that question, right? So that's one of the big issues that we were just talking about at our faculty retreat. How do we bring in um, the marketplace to really understand? How do we bring in this sort of reflection and be able to, um, uh, to have some solid, measurable results to understand that question? That's huge. The other big question that came out of this as we started doing some, some deep thinking um, is that uh, you know, we have this mission, freely receive, freely you give. What does that mean in terms of our theology um, as, a, as a group? You know, we feel very strongly that um, this has to do with something to do with access and availability. I mean, grace has something to do with access and availability. So, so we need to think very deeply about this, very deeply about this question of how do we help people succeed? How do we figure this out? And I'm not suggesting we have any answers yet, but I think we're at least embarking on a trail that will help us get some answers. And I think we do need to tie this to our mission, and we do need to tie this to our theology and who it is, who we are as an institution. I think that's extremely important. Um, and that will enable us to answer whatever questions the Department of Education brings our way. And we need to be proactive about doing this. One of the things we learned with um, this great work with the OIE is there is a pile of data we are sitting on and we're just not asking good questions. You know, we started figuring out we weren't even asking the right questions. If we start asking good questions, we actually already have data that can help us begin to develop answers. Um, so it's being thoughtful. 
Another thing that we really learned in this process, as I mentioned, we have faculty from, from decision sciences, faculty from um, information systems and technology management, faculty from um, economics, faculty from finance, um, and of course uh, our, our group who's helping us at the OIE, it's, it's really important that we work together. It's really important that we work together to figure these things out. Now as we tunnel into the classes, because ultimately this touches what we do in our classrooms, if we're asking this other question, how do we help people to succeed, then in a, in a technology-enabled learning environment, we have to be very um, intentional and critical about the learning community we create. And, and actually, believe it or not, this is part of the genesis of this whole project, was thinking about um, how can we understand and better facilitate this learning community. So what you're looking at is the back end of our social graph. Okay, and we have um, a tool called uh, Yammer, and we have our online MBA, and we have a suite of tools under um, uh, Glean, the Grazidio Learning Environment and Network, and there is a pile of data there <laughs> that we really haven't looked at very closely that can tell us more about what's happening in these ways in the learning community, because um, we need to understand what is going on so that we can achieve our mission as a university and align that at the classroom level all the way through um, to uh, the university level. And we believe that you can create different pathways for success for students. And with that, I'm going to open it up to questions or comments and name calling about all. <laughs> the big debate in law schools today is law schools teach you to think like a lawyer, very little about how to practice a, like a lawyer. Wow. Have any studies been made in MBA schools or other schools where it's more important to teach theoretical rather than practical? You know, we actually are heavy on the practice. I think um, we have this we have this acronym, okay, that um, that when all new faculty come in, we talk about uh, the teaching experience, um, relational, experiential, applied, and learner focused, and we want all of our classes to embody these principles in one way or another in instructional design, okay, and it gets back to instructional design, it really does. And you'll notice that this spells real. It's all about keeping it real. Because you know what executives want, and I work with them all the time, what they want is absolutely applied. They want, you to, they want to know that you know how to do something, and they want to know that you can do it right now. Not tomorrow. <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's a completely different world, particularly now at this economic inflection point where we sit on. And we feel at the business school, we are capacity building. That's what we're doing in our communities. That's why we're out here in the outer kingdom, building capacity in our communities so that we can help business professionals succeed in business. Is that and different from other degrees in business? I went to business school, I went to English Tuck School also. This is what you're doing at the business school. What about other schools, for other doctors or engineers, what do they do? They teach practice or just theoretical? That's a great question. I can't speak to that. Any other questions or comments, rebuttal, name calling? Well, I'm really interested, and I'm very rusty in statistics, but I'm really interested, did you get, um, get to the point where you were able to look really closely at the quantitative and what skills in those classes really, because that seems to be the biggest predictor. You know, that's, that's exactly it. That's what we'd like to do. It would be really nice if you had like this competency-based model, and that's where a lot of corporations are going competency-based models, competency-based skills. I don't know, and I'm, I'm wondering if, again, we're using an old model where I think it's important to understand that, but what I really want to understand at the end of the day is um, you know, how we can trigger ourselves to ask questions in the environment to understand what they're building in their learning community, because that's what's going to carry them through. Um, they need to learn these skills, and I think we have ways, uh, and we have a good um, assessment assurances of learning. We're build, you know, we've been building that for a while, and I, I think we need to map it and understand, which is to your question. But I think a, a very important part of that is actually helping them build that learning community that's going to um, engage them for the rest of their life.
because when you step out into business today, it's going to be different tomorrow. And then uh, five or six years from now, it's going to be different again. And one of the most important things you're going to take away is this ability to, um, to continuously learn and a community to do that with. And so, and that's what we find very engaging. I know Linda had to, had to step out in terms of our approach to online learning, which also uses these same principles and is also highly interactive. We use a concept called social presence. We believe social presence is extremely um, important. And, uh, and so that's what we, um, that's what guides the standards by which we developed things in that area. Great question. This is sort of assessment related, but it was being a statistic person that you might be, and but Jim I, is. <laughs> I, I am not myself, but um, if we are successful in our goals in assessment, doesn't it go to follow that our grades would be inflated because they're learning more and this better? So I mean, the two seem counter, like it's hard to bring grades down while we're being more effective teachers. And I'm not even sure grades should be in that conversation myself. I guess that's where I sit on assessment. Mm -hmm. I think assessment should be just on core items. And in fact, we don't look at those who succeed. <coughs> I don't care about those who succeed. It's kind of how I would look at customer relationship um, um, management in, a, in an enterprise. I really don't care about those whose expectations I've exceeded. What I'm really interested in in the social graph are those who have not. And where, what's gone wrong? And how can we correct that? Because um, that's going to generate the things that I want to happen in terms of value. And I think that's what should happen in assessment. We should actually be looking at those outliers, those four. What happened there? Who were they? Can we break that down? Can we disaggregate? What can we learn from that? How do we position them for success? And it may not be our fault at all. I'm not suggesting that it is. But if we can understand what was going on, if we can understand their story, then that will help us achieve our mission. They might have been promoted. What? Who knows? Instead, right. you know, I'm, I'm a, yeah. And this is more of a comment on uh, the other question about the difference between theory and practice. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, you can come up with theory purely from conjecture or the philosophy or thought process or whatever. But you can also come up with theory from empirical data, and you're trying to figure out sure. how that works. So ultimately, at the end of the day, it's not just, I would submit that the most elegant theory is the one that works in practice. Right. Because we sure. all have that's to true. live in the real world, and that's the only way we'll be able to meet the mission mm -hmm. of what we are about, training you know, practical leaders for service and leadership and mm -hmm. all, all those other things. And so I think the debate should not be about just the theory and the practice, but should be the utility and the, and the realization of the application of good theoretical principles and philosophy in a meaningful life, mm -hmm. and of course derived by ethics and all the other values that go along with it. I mean, this has been, is, uh, if you talk to most CEOs or most executives, they'll say they like people with business who come from a liberal arts school. Because if they learn business in a value-centered liberal arts education, like Pepperdine has, then they can discern the finer points of life and not lead to the kind of great recession we've had, which is driven by lack of ethics and greed. Well, I, I do believe in the, the sanctity of choice and that we are creating decision makers, right? So we need to inform sacred choices. And that was, that was well said. Thank you. Consistent with what was just said, thinking that qualitative courses would be more likely to uh, work on the critical thinking and cognitive flexibility side of the equation. Have you any thoughts as to why those courses are not correlated as well to success? You and this is what we've been asking ourselves, and we haven't tested, so I can tell you kind of what our guesses are, what our thoughts might be. It could be that um, you know a lot of the MBAJ students do, um, they focus heavily on finance because that's where they're headed out. So it could be just that's where they're going in their career and that's why it's a strong predictor. We don't know. We, ha we actually, as you were saying, it's important to get out in the marketplace and see what's happening afterward, right? And we don't have the, we don't have the epilogue yet. We want to have the epilogue. So, um, so that's important. Um, but it could be something else. And it could be, and you'll notice that you know, it wasn't that either one, and Jim can speak to this more, it was a stronger prediction, but it's still not telling you a whole lot. Mm -hmm. So there's other factors that are clearly very important 
that we haven't begun to model or think about yet? Well, I have a thought, and that is that maybe it's a measurement error. Hmm. Um, in that um, you are, it's a very quantitative program, therefore you're probably favoring quantitative measures uh, of student progress. And you might be missing the student's ability to think the big picture, that relational part, in the way you assess progress and success. You know, I would buy that if it were a quantitative program. <laughs> I think most of our faculty, and I don't know if I showed the slide that showed the breakdown of the courses, they have twice as many qualitative courses as they do quantitative courses. I think our faculty at the Glass Dio School would kind of, and I don't want to like cause any explosions here or you know any massive you know rioting, but I think that our faculty would by and large say there's a heavy weighting on the qualitative side in the program, and it's off grade. So. That really worries me because there should be a huge correlation. That's why we're asking the question. <laughs> I, mean, can, I would look at it also on the flip side, which is I think the reason we're seeing such a strong correlation on the quantitative courses is that you know if someone's conducting a hypothesis test, if someone is conducting <coughs> or calculating the cost of capital, uh, if someone is is, is performing a, uh, an accounting calculation or an income statement or a balance sheet, there's often really one answer, um, and so there's not a lot of ambiguity if when you provide that student feedback. If And by the way, it's not that we don't think, we think that's clearly very, 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 very important. And in fact, Kevin Groves, who's also on the committee, who um, has helped us with this project and other projects, has been involved with helping us look at those faculty recommendations. Because we think there's this whole pool of success factors that are out there. Because remember, this is just one, and it's not telling us even a great deal. But we think there are things such as professionalism, maturity, accountability. There's got to be these other things that maybe are in these faculty recommendations that we can fish out, that relate to these ideas of, of uh, critical thinking. In fact, at the faculty retreat, um, one of our faculty was just bringing up the question, maybe there's just some cognitive differences between people who take a more linear approach and people who you know, have to circle through a few times, and maybe that's something that we need to put on the table. I don't know how you get out that, but, um, but that's another possibility. It would be interesting to see if you could um, see if there's a correlation between the qualitative uh, GPA and uh, success in the, in the work environment after graduation. Mm -hmm. I, think it, I think there's great questions. I think there's great questions. And uh, I'm not dissing any of my qual brothers. <laughs> <laughs> Just so you know, right? <laughs> Yeah, and I think it's about asking these kinds of questions. We need to have it on the table, figure out what data we have, and see what we can figure out. This was very insightful to us, and we took it to our faculty, and our um, and it's 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 had an impact on the decisions that we've made, and uh, and uh, and how we're advancing our programs, and how we're um, continuing. I think there's there are other people who would like to do the same thing and figure out exactly how things are going. So um, I encourage you all to do that. And uh, I'll tell you Jim's consulting fee. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> no, we were very lucky to have this fantastic team who um, uh, is motivated because they care for our students. They care for the, the university and its, its mission. And, um, 
And this is a great group, and I really want to thank um, Novita and, and, uh, and all of her help because scraping the stuff out of PeopleSoft is not um, <laughs> is non trivial, and uh, and so it's it takes it takes a team, and they need to work together. So um, and we need to work together across schools as we figure things out. We need to let you know, and as you figure things out, please let us know. What percent of your professors have had great experience in business and then gone to the business school? Most. Either, most it's almost a requirement. We have some How new much? faculty here. Um, we have a new faculty member here. How long have you worked in the industry? Yes. Uh, 15 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would say 15 years, you know, anywhere anywhere from 10 to 15 is probably the... Well, <coughs> most of two or three years. Uh, yeah, and in fact, there's kind of this culture of, uh, you know, uh, why don't I just make that gangster movie?